today, I will share with you about a fruitful faith. There is a so-called faith which produces a lot of noise, a lot of arguments, but little or no fruit. That's not same faith, and it's not the faith that's fruitful. But first, we confess concerning this faith in Augsburg Confessions, Article 6, New Obedience, our churches teach that this faith is bound to bring forth good fruits, according to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It is necessary to do good works commanded by God because of God's will. We should not rely on those works to merit justification before God. The forgiveness of sin and justification is received through faith. The voice of Christ testifies, so you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. The fathers teach the same thing. Ambrose says, it is ordained of God that he who believes in Christ is saved, freely receiving forgiveness of sin without work, through faith alone. Bow your heads with me. Almighty God, you have called your church to witness that in Christ you have reconciled us to yourself. Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may proclaim the good news of your salvation so that all who hear it may receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. From our gospel today, the next day, he, that is John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Now, some people argue that living by faith in Christ is a foolish proposition. They say you can't govern your life by something you cannot verify scientifically, something that is based upon a 2,000 year old story. When it comes to things, under the sun, as the writer of Ecclesiastes described the things that pertain to this life only and not to the life to come, I would agree. I would not ask you to live your life based upon the teachings of Socrates or Plato or any other number of humans who lived a long time ago. In fact, I would not encourage you to govern your life based on anyone's teachings if the last thing that person had to show for their efforts was a grave and a decayed corpse. John entered into his ministry based upon God's promise to reveal the Son of God to him as he carried out his prophetic ministry of calling Israel to repentance and baptizing those who responded to his preaching. John obeyed God's call and preached that the kingdom of God is at hand. When Jesus came, submitting to John's baptism, God confirmed Jesus as Messiah. The Holy Spirit showed himself by descending as a dove and remaining upon Jesus. And this empowered John in his witness to Israel. John said, I myself did not know him. But for this purpose, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. Now I know when Jesus was inside Mary's womb and Mary went to visit Elizabeth, John responded to the presence of Christ. He leaped with joy. And yet, the scriptures don't tell us that John and Jesus played with each other as they grew up, that they hung out together. In fact, based on John's words here, they may have never seen each other before this moment. And John bore witness. I saw the spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. 
I myself did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I bear, and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now, the idea of bearing witness is not unique to John. Isaiah 43.10 presents the Lord himself addressing Israel and calling the nation to bear witness that he is the true and living God in contrast to the demonic so-called God of the nations. Isaiah 43.10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. That you may know and believe me and understand that I am. Those same words that the Lord used to introduce and identify himself to Moses at the burning bush. I am that I am, or in Greek, I am the existent one. Ego, any, or own. That's God's name to all generations, he said. And so every time when Jesus would say, I am. They would hear the echo of those words from that bush. Now, until Jesus' appearance at the Jordan, John's message was preparatory. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. After Christ's baptism, John no longer prepared the way for him. He bore witness to him. The next day, John 1.35, the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Now, over time, more and more people would turn to Jesus, and John rejoiced that his work was bearing fruit, even though that meant he was no longer in the spotlight. Instead of fighting to remain relevant or seeking a new message that would keep him in the public eye, John embraced the will of the Father as a good and faithful servant. John chapter 3, verses 28 through 30. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. In a sermon that he delivered on February 4th, 1968, two months before his assassination, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. talked about the opposite tendency, the desire that the old Adam stirs up in each of us. Encouraged by faith, we desire to be first, to be in charge, to be important. In the sermon entitled The Drum Major Instinct, the Reverend Dr. King shined a light on the other side of the infamous crabs in a barrel syndrome. You've heard of it, by which we seek to pull others down. In the drum major instinct, we seek to elevate ourselves, sparing no expense, expending every effort to ensure that we are the center of our world. Dr. King said, we all want to be important, to surpass others, to achieve distinction, to lead the parade. Alfred Adler, the great psychoanalyst, contends that this is the dominant impulse. Sigmund Freud used to contend that sex was the dominant impulse. And Adler came with a new argument, saying that this quest for recognition, this desire for attention, this desire for distinction is the basic impulse, the basic drive of human life, this drum major instinct. And you know, we begin early to 
to ask life to put us first. Our first cry as a baby was a bid for attention. And all through childhood, the drum major impulse or instinct is a major obsession. Children ask life to grant them first place. They are a little bundle of ego. And they have innately the drum major impulse or the drum major instinct. Now, in adult life, we still have it. And we really never get by it. We like to do something good. And you know, we like to be praised for it. Now, if you don't believe that, just go on living life. And you'll discover very soon that you like to be praised. You don't have to say me. Everybody likes it as a matter of fact. And somehow, I heard that. <laughs> and somehow this warm glow we feel when we are praised or when our name is in print is something of the vitamin A to our ego. Nobody is unhappy when they are praised, even if they know they don't deserve it, even if they don't believe it. The only unhappy people about praise is when that praise is going too much towards somebody else. But everybody likes to be praised because of this real drum major instinct. Now, King ended that sermon by saying that at his funeral, don't let the message be about his greatness of prestige, but about his greatness of service. He said, yes. Yeah, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. Yes, I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a word or song, if I can show somebody that he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian ought, if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message as the master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Now, those things are well and good, and they are admirable. But still, they only punt the ball downfield because they still leave us looking at Dr. King. And I'm not criticizing you. Uh, first of all, we can't go beyond what we're taught. And Dr. King went to some good schools. Don't get me wrong. You know, he went to Harvard. But Dr. King was never taught the proper distinction of law and gospel. Dr. King was never taught to see everything through a Christological lens, to see everything that's focused on Jesus Christ, even though Jesus himself said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think to have life, and these are they which testify of me. But he does give some, some great speeches, doesn't he? But I can show you where his grave is located. And the body is right there. So not even he is the one to whom I bear witness today, although tomorrow is his birthday. No, I bid you to look. Well, I know you celebrate, you know, tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Those of you, many of you are getting off work tomorrow, right? All because of his birthday today. But I bid you to look today, not to Mark, but to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith, according to the scriptures. Our gospel text continues. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, 
We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathaniel said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly I say to you, you will see heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I know that wasn't part of the reading, but just bear with me. Because even today, we see messengers of God. That's what the word angel means, the messenger. We see messenger of God fulfilling their vocation. Well, only as they do so in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, only insofar as they are ascending and descending on the Son of God. Only insofar as the message that they go to receive from God and the message that they share with you is in the name of Jesus Christ. It's concerning Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Redeemer, and as your King. And even today, we see the messengers of God doing this. And so when we preach, it is either Christ whom we preach, or we do not preach anything that is worth hearing. Our message, if it is not concerning the gospel of the kingdom of God and of his Christ, is not worth the breath that conveys it, or the paper that contains it. As Paul said, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel, which he defined by the power of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 5, for I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas then to the twelve. That is the purest gospel. Christ died on that old rugged cross for you to pay for your sin. And then he rose from the dead for your justification. In his name, the forgiveness of sins is preached. And there is no other name given under heaven whereby you must be saved. He makes us fruitful unto every good work as his spirit works in us both to will and to do for God's good pleasure. He makes us alive to righteousness. He has power to destroy the works of the devil. He is our just God and our Savior, and he shall reign forever and ever. It is his kingdom alone that is perfectly righteous. His kingdom alone, in which all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And if you want to find peace, righteousness, and joy, you will find it not at the banquets of men, but at the table of the Lord, where Christ comes to you in the bread and the cup, at the altar and pulpit where the pure gospel is preached, in the word of life with God's exceeding great and precious promises that are declared both from the altar and from the congregation that set you free from the law of sin and death. A fruitful faith, a faith that not only bears witness internally for you, but manifests itself all around you as you go forth walking by faith and not by sight, telling others the good news that God is for them, that Christ is their Savior, that he is their Redeemer, and he is their soon-coming King. As you, walking by faith, share with them the good news that, no, this is not heaven, and it never will be heaven. But the King 
of heaven is coming back. And when he comes back, his reward is with him to give to everyone according to their doing. To those who trusted in his name, eternal life. And so tell them all today, while it is called today, hear his word. Do not reject him who speaks, because he who speaks is he who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask or think, but he is able to do everything that he has promised for you. And the peace of God that passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen.